Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for those of you that didn't make it yesterday, uh, Ben and Kate are officially married. Nathan and Lori are officially relieved. Uh, it was a, a very nice service. Um, nobody passed out. Nobody panicked and ran away. Well, we caught Nathan, but we brought him back. <laughs> um, we are going to continue with our Testify series, and I have asked if Pat Gruenhagen would come and share her testimony. And after giving me a lot of dirty looks, she agreed. So, <laughs> so Pat, I'm just going to turn it over to you. <sighs> okay, I'm nervous. <laughs> um, I'm not going to be able to get into all the miracles that God's given to us personally, because um, there's too much. Um, and I'll read back and forth because I had to write it down for the most part. And the, okay. God is omniscient. He's omnipresent, whether we accept it or not. I was born two months early due to my mother trying to get rid of me. Um, I was two and a half pounds. Daddy said my bed was his 12, size 12 shoe box. Um, back then, Sometimes you didn't last when you were that little. I thought, what happened? Anyway. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, my brother and I, he was three years older than myself. Dad divorced my mother, who was kind of an alcoholic and just wasn't a very nice person. Anyway, they got divorced. Daddy dropped Mike and I off at my grandparents, and again, God's hand on us. Um, they were wonderful Christian people. Grandfather was Quaker, so I grew up with the King James English, that, you know, if you got in trouble now, Patty, then you mustn't do that. Um, grandmother had a fly swatter, that was fly <laughs> So anyway, it was I was it was a great Christian upbringing. Um, emotionally, I don't know how many people when they're not raised with the family, it is a little bit difficult because number one, your siblings think you're spoiled rotten because you're living with grandma and grandpa. Believe me, we had chores. We lived on a goat farm. Um, <clears throat> every night after supper, grandfather would sit. He had his recliner and his lamp right there and by the fireplace, and he would read scripture. That was a nightly thing. So, praise the Lord, I was grounded because I got sidetracked here and there. Um, we attended a, a Brethren Church, and we had this wonderful Pastor Cole. And like every other week, he would lay out the plan of salvation. And he made it, I mean, it was just real, you know. So, when I was 11, I asked Jesus into my heart, formally. Even though I, I think I knew him before, because he, he, I mean, he just kept his hand on me. Um, then when I was 11 and a half, grandma died. That was not cool. And I was kind of mad at God. How could he take my mother figure away from me? And then a year later, grandpa married again, a lady that I knew all my life, because it was his son-in-law's mother. Um, what, she was a sweet lady, too. Anyway, I went to back to live with the family. Well, nine kids, um, and at that age, you kind of don't fit in anymore. 
You can't fit in. So, anyway, I, I got through part of my schooling, and uh, I quit school. Talked my dad into letting me quit school. I, they took the courses away that I wanted. I was getting straight A's. They still wouldn't let me have it. We went to this ritzy district. We were poor folks, by the way. Anyway, so they took my classes away, so stuck me in secretarial courses, and I went, no, no, it wasn't for me, so I went to work. In the meantime, I, well, actually later, I met my husband, and he was in the army, he's not serious, you know, wrote him over in Germany, gave him a de Dear John letter, <laughs> anyway, he's <laughs> too young to get married. Anyway, so a couple years after that, we did get married. I come out on the train to Montana, and having my grandparents as an example of what married life was supposed to be, um, I was not prepared. Um, Kenny had heard about the Lord. But at that point, he hadn't accepted it. So anyway. So then we had, in nine and a half years, we had nine pregnancies, and I got four live ones out of it. So it was definitely interesting. So I got four little kids running around, and we didn't have a very good married life at that point. And it got a little bit... Um, Hectic, but God was with me. And even though I wasn't trying to live for him right then, he protected me. And I know we are inside, no matter what was all going on outside, I still knew he was with me. So then it ended up that we, um, I had visited with some ladies, um, and they had given me some information and stuff. And it, it kind of got bad. And so I found a place for me and my four kids. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm not really trained for anything. Um, I have four kids to feed. What am I going to do? <laughs> you know? So the way I prayed was, okay, Lord, I'm done. Nine and a half years of this, I can't do it anymore. And you can't do it in your own power. You just can't. I said, I'm getting a divorce. If anybody else, if you want it somewhere else, some way else, you do it. I'm done. So, went back home after about a week, and he moved out. So we're getting these expensive divorce lawyers. But at least to me it was expensive, you know, just kind of, wow. Um, during this time, thank the Lord, he did not have a problem with us sending the kids to church so they would catch the church bus. And they wanted their dad to go with them. Um, he had gone, part of the divorce thing, he was trying to sell our car so that the kids and I would have money to go back to Indiana. Unbeknownst to me, the gentleman that he was trying to sell the car to had been witnessing to my husband. So he's telling me, say, I'm going, nah, don't believe it. Mm -mm. No, too many years, uh uh. So we were still talking divorce, we're still planning on it. Well, guess what? This man that was. Uh, Witnessing to my husband had already led my boys to the Lord. Mm -hmm. He was their Sunday school teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and I got a lot to say for Sunday school teachers because I had a uh, Mrs. Cordy that was my Sunday school teacher that was wonderful. Visited with her all the time. Made time for the kids. So anyway, Kenny agreed to go to church with them. And I think he went a couple of times and I wasn't going because I just... Just, no. 
so a couple weeks after that, it was um, in October, I believe. <coughs> we all went. Well, they had an altar call. My boys went forward and accepted Christ formally. And wonder wonders, my husband went forward and accepted the word formally. And I'm going, oh, okay. Um, and it was, I was sitting there and I was debating, I mean, we're still going through this, you know, we still got this divorce thing going. But it was like the Holy Spirit just lifted me up. He says, you know, it's time for you to come home. Enough. And it was just like he lifted me up and here we are, our family down at the altar. <laughs> and it was cool. It was really cool. Some folks, you know, as soon as you're saved, everything changes. Not always. <laughs> it's a slow process. <laughs> um, but the miracles that happened since then, I mean, we're paying off <coughs> divorce bills, divorce lawyer bills, right? So we're kind of down, and uh, there wasn't much left in the cupboards, and it was a day or two before payday still. And the gentleman that led Kenny to the Lord had six kids. And Monty called up and he says, we're coming over for dinner. <laughs> up, 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 up. I don't have anything I can even scratch together. Come on, guys. But he had already hung up on me. So they came over with like 12 bags of groceries. The oh. Lord provides. Mm -hmm. Um, also that same year, I got cervical cancer. And Kimmy was two, and when they told me, I gotta tell this part first, because there is hope for me. There really is. Not that way, but there's hope. I've been on both ends of the spectrum. I was well over 200 pounds when they told me that I got cancer. In six weeks, I went from over 200 pounds the 78 pounds oh and God. eating like a horse. Wow. So when they told me, I asked the Lord, I said, I'm looking at Kimberly, our youngest, she was just two. And I, Lord, not yet. And was it Hezekiah mm -hmm. that asked for the extra 15 yep. years? And he gave the look, look how many years I've got. <laughs> it's cool, you know? So anyway, that was taken care of. Um, Kenny was, about a year later, um, he was growing leaps and bounds. They had a, a really neat Bible study where everybody was involved. I mean, even the kids were involved, you know. And we'd get off on rabbit trails, but it was so cool because the kids would ask a question. Well, what about the dinosaurs? Yeah. And the, the leaders, the men in the church, would take the time to tell, the, you know, to explain to the kids and give them different ways of looking at things from scripture. So, we had a kid from our church that was going on a, um, like a Lewis and Clark mission type thing. Now, mind you, in between times, we're reading and we're growing. Thankfully, I'd already, you know, the, the grandparents had really grounded me, and we, I knew a lot of the Bible, but it was, we ate it up. We just ate it up. Not that I can memorize anything. The brain doesn't work so good. Anyway, um, one of the kids from our church in Missoula Bible Fellowship years ago was going on a trip to Canada. To like a Lewis and Clark thing. Well, Long story short, he, their group, the rafts broke in Button Bay and they drowned. Um, his mother, at that time, you could, Canadians couldn't drive American vehicles and his mother needed John's stuff back and this vehicle and everything. So Kenny had told her that we would go up. 
and I won't get too involved in that, but the Lord worked every single step of the way. It, it was it was just, you know, boom, 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 boom. Um, I was working at Singer at the time. My boss was on vacation. He told me if, if I, if Leo, who worked with me, would cover my time, then sure, he didn't have a problem. Well, I didn't know Leo. He did a, I was very skeptical. Um, he agreed. Well, if you can promise to be back, I said, I can't promise that. I said, I could try to be. So anyway, we didn't have the money. Kenny's dad came forth with the money, and we rode the bus up to, what is it, what's it called? Churchill. Churchill. Uh, what's the province? Manitoba. Yes, yeah. thank you. Okay. So the last 80 miles of this is Gravel Road. Oh, by the way, I got to sit by a Nazarene lady. Oh, we had fun. Anyway. <laughs> um, all the way up. Three days on the bus. Okay. So then we get up there and we get this dilapidated car. I mean, it was dilapidated. Oh my. They had rags stuffed into this pipe that was going in the glove compartment. It was interesting. Okay, so we get back, and that's Thanksgiving Day, their Thanksgiving Day. So anyway, we get back, and just constantly, I, I, what I, I need to backtrack. I had prayed that the Lord would make this such a witness to my husband that it would strengthen him and encourage him to keep going. And it was, let's see. Um, we got help for this car when nobody said they could. Uh, we lost a tire. One guy says, the, the tire guy, he says, oh, you're not gonna find that size tire in the all of Canada. Let me check my garage. Uh, okay. <laughs> so he goes home, he's got a brand new tire that size. <laughs> okay, this is after some kind of alternator generator. I'm not a car person, but the Lord found these pieces. We spent, at the motel that we barely made it into the drive, um, the wife was saved, the husband was not. But the, we, Kenny asked if they knew any Christian mechanics. Guess what? <laughs> she says, oh, well, come with me. Then she stops and says, you're not Jehovah's Witness, are you? And <laughs> 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 he said, no, no. <laughs> So anyway, we met two other couples, fantastic people. They helped Kenny with the car. We get to, to driving out, and that was back when the tire happened, huh? Yeah. So anyway, we had to go back. There's only three. Diamond Lake, Manitoba, that's where it was. Um, three gas stations, repair stations, whatever, in the town. So anyway, between this trip, we had made all of them. Okay, so we had Thanksgiving dinner with these folks. We headed back down, and there was a blizzard, unbeknownst to us. Uh, Kenny's dad drove for a while. Uh, Kenny drove for a while. That was my turn. Well, I was supposed to go on 20 or 10 or get on the other one, and anyway, I missed it. So we came out above North Dakota. <laughs> so we, not knowing that we could go ahead and cross, we waited in this freezing car. There was no heat, by the way. Um, but we had salmon, smoked salmon, that the folks at the motel had given us. And uh, we waited for the border to open. Okay, we get back in. And we get back over to Great Falls. And we find out, you know, we went up to Lethbridge, Lethbridge, <coughs> but we found out there'd been a blizzard. Nine people had lost their lives. Yeah. And the Lord had his hand on us. Yeah. So then we stopped in Great Falls. And Kenny's sharing with his family. His mom was there, his sister was there, and his brother Davis was there. So he's sharing everything that happened. <coughs> I'm, I'm just skimming over a lot of it. 
because it was cool. It was really cool. Um, Here's David over here listening to the testimony when Kenny's talking to his sister. We didn't know that. But through it, John's mother came to know the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I will explain that John was Kelly's roommate to Crusader Hall. <laughs> And we found that out later when we started going here. <laughs> because I said, I know that kid. <laughs> they're showing me pictures. There's someone showing us pictures. And I said, I know that kid. And they're laughing because it was Kelly when he was a kid. Uh, it, was, it was wild, small world, huh? <laughs> so anyway, we have had such blessings over the years. We're going on 44, by the way. Um, so when you think you're going to give up on your marriage, because like I tell my kids, I says, you still have to love them. You might not like them very much, but you still got to love them. It says so. You know? <laughs> and then and it, it's sad because our kids saw so many of these miracles that we're still praying for them to come back. And I know that the Lord will bring him back because he brought me back. Mm -hmm. He got me straightened out. And we every day we don't how do I say um, we don't see all the work he's doing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't recognize it. But I am so grateful. I can do this. That he died for me. Amen. He loves me. Sometimes when you're not lovable, when nobody else does, he still loves you. And we can always, always hang on to that. I have to share with you one of my frustrations as a pastor. There's not enough time. <laughs> There's not enough time. I have got to sit with Ken and Pat a number of times, and I've got to hear pieces of their testimony. And I, I have from what they've told me, I haven't even come close to hearing everything that makes up their testimony. But wow, God has done something. Incredible things in their lives. And, you know, the, my frustration is I, I get to spend such a little bit of time with each of you, and I get only to hear little bits of what God has done in your lives. Everybody has a story. Everybody has a story. If you're here right now, it's because God brought you here right now. Whether or not you're serving Him is irrelevant. God has brought you here right now. Um, thank you, Pat. And she, she showed me her notes, and there's no way you covered all those notes. Not even close. So, um, there's my notes for today, and there they go. We'll get to them next week. Um, I have a couple things that I want to talk about regarding last week's message. We spoke last week, we started the Fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. Uh, you can go ahead and turn there if you want. talked about um, how God is, is really dealing with Christy and I on walking in the Spirit. And how I, I don't have much of a clue what that means. That I, I really struggle with understanding how to do that. And I know one of the things that he's told me is it's moment by moment, step by step. Okay, you don't just all of a sudden say, you know what, I'm going to walk by the Spirit. And from that point on, the rest of your life, you walk by the Spirit. It doesn't work that way. It had not work that way for me. And so, um, 
Picking up here in verse 22, uh, we're, we're starting off, he's contrasting the works of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit. So in verse 22 he says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, I want to share with you first. Do you, do you see whose fruit this is? Do you, do you see this? It's not my fruit. Okay? It's not your fruit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. So, if you don't have God's Spirit living inside of you, this fruit is not born out. Now, you can see people that are loving, but we talked last week about love, because the love that he uses here is... Agape, okay, and, and we know there are four Greek words describing love, and three of them are used in Scripture, but this one is the love that God says when, when he says, God is love in 1 John, that, that's this kind of love, it's agape, it's selfless. It's not based on the receiver, it's based on the giver, okay, and one of the things that I was really struggling with last week, there were a couple things that I didn't get to that I really wanted to touch on, and I actually had a couple people come up and ask me questions about last week's message, and I thought, you know what, I need to go back and, and touch on a couple things. So, I'm going noteless, alright? So bear with me. Um, first, one of the things that we need to address is agape is not something that is based of you. Okay, when it says that we have to love, you have to understand it's not based on your ability to accomplish this. Okay, and that should relieve a great burden from you, because if you think you can do this and you start doing it, you're going to fall on your face, and eventually you're going to get frustrated and throw your hands up in the air and say, I can't do it, and God's going to say, right. You're exactly right. You can't do this. I do this. Okay, because it's his nature. Okay. Now, when you come to the cross, you crucify your old self, that person dies. You are resurrected into new life, a new creation in Christ Jesus. The life you live, you no longer live, but he lives in you. All right? Now, that means all that he is comes inside of us and should, by very definition, ooze out of us. Okay? It, it should work its way out. It's like a sponge. You know? You soak a sponge in water and lift it up, and what comes out of it? Well, at my house, Kool-Aid. <laughs> but what's inside the sponge comes out, right? And what happens when you squeeze the sponge? <coughs> More of it comes out, and it just keeps coming out. That's the way we should be living our lives. As God is filling us with His Spirit, the very nature of his spirit should be oozing out of us. Okay? So first, when I'm talking about agape love, it's not you, it's him. So that takes some of the burden off of you because you can't do it. God's not expecting you to do it. He's expecting you to allow him to do it. Okay? So that's the first thing we need to know. That it's him, not us. Not me. I can't do this. He does it. Okay? Second thing... This is problematic because you have to let him do it. Sweetie, come here for a second. She gave me a not very friendly look. <laughs> this is my beautiful wife because I don't have a wife that's not beautiful. Okay? You know this is my wife, right? When she's sitting over there, is she still my wife? Are we close and intimate? Not when she's sitting over there, we're not. Hello, wife. Hello, wife. <laughs> In order for us to be intimate, for us to be close, we have to be in each other's presence, we have to communicate, we have to share, we have to be open. Thank you. Now she's going back. No, this is done. My illustration's not done. Oh, no, she, she's, she's free. Okay. 
But if she's over there and I'm up here, how's it going, Pat? Good. Good? Yeah. <laughs> you have a good week this week? Really? Oh, nice. Alan? Is he still there? Still today? <coughs> okay. Am I having a relationship with Christy? Well, yeah, we have a relationship, but am I working on that relationship right now? No. See, we, we treat God the same way. Now, we come into a relationship with God, and we say, okay, you're Lord of my life. Except for here, here, and here. And that, put that down. I, I, I'll take control of that. You are the love of my life. But then we give our devotion and our adoration to other things. We say, I want you to be my God. But then we bow down to other things. Okay? So, if you want to exhibit the nature and the person of God, He lives in you, what do you have to do? You have to be close to Him, right? How do you get close to God? Well, yeah, I mean, we can read the Word. We can pray. We can um, go to Bible studies. We can worship. We can listen to Christian radio. Do you know how many people I come across that think that that, like, impresses me because they listen to SOS? So what? I know a lot of people that listen to a lot of stuff. It doesn't mean anything. It means you got your radio on. Are you paying attention? Are you applying what it tells you? We have got to be close to God to start exhibiting the character and the nature of God. We can't just say, oh, I'm a Christian, and expect Christ-likeness to come out of us. Now, all of those things are good things to do, but those should be the end result of a relationship. Right? How many of you know how I feel about coffee? <laughs> I don't like coffee. I have no use for it at all. I know I just offended some of you. Apostasy, heresy. <laughs> you can drink your coffee. That's absolutely fine. I don't have a problem with you drinking coffee. But quite honestly, if someone were to set a cup of coffee down in front of me, I would die of thirst. <laughs> Happily. But every morning, I have a routine. I get up, and I, I get my morning ablutions done, and I have my quiet time, and Christy and I pray together, but I always, in there somewhere, I make coffee for Christy. Why? Because I hate coffee. Why would I do that? Because she likes coffee. And every morning, that's one way I can speak love to her. Does it cost me anything? Well, if you don't mind me making coffee like this. <laughs> I don't do that. Um, why do I do that? Because it speaks to her. Because it's not about me. And see, we need to understand that same thing in relationship with God. you got to get over yourself. I was praying this week, and God spoke to me something that I felt like he wanted me to tell the church, and I've been arguing with him ever since because I don't want to say it. Uh, he is, because I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> God says you are a stiff-necked people. And some of you have said, God, I will go this far and no further. And you have put him in a box and told him to stay. And said that I will not accept of you beyond what I will accept. And God says I will share my glory 
with no one. He will not be second in your life. It doesn't work that way. We don't get that choice. He's either first or he's nothing. And see, we have a throne in our heart. And whatever we're bowing down to is what is on that throne. And I tell you, for a lot of us, it's pride. If you could turn the mirror on the throne of your heart, would you be the one sitting on it? Or would God be there? You see, God's plans for you are good plans. Did you notice in the psalm that I read, a thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand? Did you notice it was going on around you? You were in the midst of it. The horrible things are happening around you. God's not going to take you out of them. But what's he going to do? He's going to be with you in them. He's going to be the shield about you, the buckler that protects you. There's this fallacy that if you come to Christ, life is peaches and cream and a bed of roses. And it's a lie. Because when you come to Christ, Jesus said, hey, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. But, but what did he say when that happens? He said, rejoice. Because great is your reward in heaven. See, we still have this American mentality. Get in, get rich, get out. And that doesn't work. There's nowhere in Scripture that that works in eternity. We're in this for endurance for the long run. We're in this to the end. That's where our reward is. Now, don't get me wrong. God gives us incredible things in this life. That's His nature. But people, we have got to get off the throne of our lives and put God there and keep Him there and bow to Him and Him only. To Him and no one or no thing. Read a passage out of James. I'm going to be in James chapter 4. James 4, I'm going to start in verse 1. It says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this? that your passions are at war within you. You desire and you do not have, so you murder, you covet, you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Tell you what, if you're bowing before the throne of God, you won't have time to be offended. If you are basking in the very presence of the magnified God, you won't be worried about the next new gizmo that comes out or how old your gizmo is. Is it not this that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. 
You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay a shocker out before you. Christy and I do not have the perfect marriage. You know why? Because the marriage is made up of Christy and I. And we're both human, and we're both flawed, and we're both striving every day to draw closer and closer to the image that God has called us to be, the image of his son, but we still mess up. We still mess up. Last night we had a, a blow up. It was a perfect day for us. It was an incredible day for us. And in the space of about 30 seconds, <coughs> now we got together in the living room. We made a commitment every night to get together in the living room with Thaddeus and McKenzie and we pray for the peace of our household. And I was mad. I was angry and I came out. We're going to pray. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> We're going to give glory to God. Dang it. And we sat down. And I, I confess, I was praying angry because I'm, I'm just laying out before God. I'm hurt and I'm angry. And Mackenzie started singing. <coughs> and it was like the tide washing out. And God was prompting me that you need to sing too. I said, I don't want to sing. I'm mad. You need to sing. I don't want to sing. I'm mad. <laughs> you need to sing. You're not listening! <laughs> I am angry right now! When Mackenzie quit singing. I'm stubborn. I'm stiff-necked. But God is teaching me to bow my head. And so I started singing. And it was the... <laughs> and we sang a song and I was quiet for a little bit and I could feel it, it was still there but it had pulled back and Mackenzie started singing another song he didn't have to ask me this time I just started singing, I knew it was coming <laughs> and I'll tell you at the time we finished singing that second song the anger was gone and I was reminded a couple weeks ago when my brother was here, he was talking about the worshipers. The worshipers led the army of God into battle. Yes. They went out and they played the instruments and they sang. And God's enemies were defeated. And how in our lives, worship has got to be a priority, not an afterthought. It's got to be a discipline, not when you feel like it. Because I did not feel like worshiping God last night. And I, to be honest with you, the fact that I was willing to pray even in that condition shows you how much God has changed me. But to have all of that received, because God was glorified in that moment. God received glory in that moment. And it was to his glory to take that anger and that hurt away. People, we have got to be better at this walk. We've got to be more committed at this walk. Look, the law of thermodynamics states this, that things tend to disorder. The second law of thermodynamics, it's called entropy. And it's a law because it always happens. If you leave something to its own, it will decay. You take Titus out of the bathtub and dress him in a cute little suit and lead him to his own. <laughs> you will see the second law of thermodynamics at work. It's the same in our lives. If we are trying to do it on our own, if we are not doing it out with the dunamis, the power of God, we have nothing to regenerate, nothing to empower us, and we will decay. And we stand before an enemy that despises our souls. We stand in a world 
that is totally contradictory to what it was intended to be. And we have a nature that is opposed to righteousness and holiness. Look, the enemy doesn't have to do a heck of a lot to throw us off track. Because I spent years and years and years rebuking the devil for my foolishness, for my pride, for my temper. Satan, I rebuke you, and he's over in Illinois doing something. What? <laughs> what did I do now? <laughs> or maybe Dubuque, I don't know where he was. <laughs> but it, all too often, it's just me. Just me. And it's my pride, because I won't humble myself before God. God, I got this. God, this is the area I've given you in my life. What are you doing out of that? Go, go back. Put, put God back. He will not be constrained. And if you will open the doors, he will do miraculous, incredible, incredible things in your life. He is going to change the very nature of who you are. And things that you thought were impossible... I'm going to share with you. Um, if you had asked me in February or March of this year to put my marriage on a scale, I would have said it's, it's probably between a 7 and an 8. And that would have been a lie, but it wouldn't have been a conscious lie. It would have been a relative lie because a 7 and 8 compared to where it used to be, not compared to 10 being the best. Um, Christy and I have been married for 27 years and over the course of 27 years there were certain areas of our life that we just we, we gave up we just thought it's never going to work this this area is never going to work and so we take it and we stick it in a closet and we shut the door and we lock it and we bolt it and nail it shut and, and, and you know put the police tape on do not cross and you never went to those areas and as long as we stayed away from those areas, we had a seven or an eight marriage. But those areas are, are very part of the fabric of our relationship, of our, our, our marriage. And God, in uh, March, April, April, started dealing with us. And, and I, I, I'll tell you, be very careful to pray for me, because if you really open yourself up to God, He will move. And sometimes He's going to move uncomfortably in your life. Because he wants to get rid of the garbage that you've got. And God started opening those doors. He started pulling down the tape, pulling out the nails, pulling off the boards, pulling off the padlocks, and he opened stuff up. And I'll tell you, Christine, I have had some, some ugly, ugly moments in the last six months. And I'll tell you, God has met us every single time. Every single time. Sometimes I'm stupid and it takes me a while. I'm, I'm just thick. I'm stiff-necked. And it takes me a while to go, God, okay, 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 okay. You do it. And then he starts to make it better. And I go, oh, okay, I see how this works. I got it now. And then I get stupid and stiff-necked again. And, and oh, God, okay, 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 you take it. Now... Last night from beginning to end was what? 30, 45 minutes. 30 or 45 minutes. And that, that would have been something that would have been probably an all-night affair, maybe even a couple of days. We're not perfect. God knows we're not perfect. But we're increasing. We're increasing. So Peter says about the fruit, he says, in increasing measure. One passage that I want to share with you. Matthew chapter 24. And there's, there's two other things that I want to say. This one I just want to give to you as a warning. Matthew chapter 24. Um, when you get the opportunity, 
read this entire chapter. Okay, Jesus is talking about the end times, what's coming. But there's one verse in here that stands out to me. <clears throat> I'm going uh, to read two verses. Actually, I'll do three. <coughs> verse 11, it says, And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. <coughs> and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now, the love of many will grow cold. People, look around you. We're seeing that today. I'm, I'm saying, look around you here in church. Look around you here in church. We, I'm, the world out there, they don't have the spirit living in them. They don't have agape love. It's only through God's spirit. In 1 John 4, it says we love because he first loved us. See, without him loving us, we wouldn't even be able to love. But the love of many will grow cold. But then there's an encouragement. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. We're in this for the long haul. This isn't a sprint. It's an endurance run. It's an endurance run. It's not just an endurance run. It's a gauntlet. But we have one that carries us through it. And we've got to let him do it. We've got to quit thinking we understand it. Get out of his way and let him live through us. Last week I ended up in 1 Corinthians 13. And I want to share with you something. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 13 is known as what? The love chapter. 1 Corinthians 13 is based on what type of love? Agape. Agape. Okay? So the first thing we need to understand is this is the type of love that is intrinsic to the nature of God, not us. Right? Right? So where does this kind of love come from? So if we're going to have this kind of love, how do we get it? Yeah, the Spirit of God living in us. He's the one that does it, right? Agape, the love is based on who? The giver or the receiver? The giver. It's based on the one giving love. Not on the response, the action or reaction of the receiver. Okay? So, when you are reading through this, everything reading through this is based first on the understanding that you cannot have this apart from the Spirit of God living in you, right? Second, if the Spirit of God is living in you, this is not based on the person or people that you are loving. It's based on you or me. Because the Spirit of God is living in me. That's his nature. That's the part that is supposed to ooze out of me. Okay? So when we go through this, look, this list, if we're looking at this going, okay, Love is patient and kind. I've already blown it. Dang it. Love does not envy or boast. Well, yeah, maybe there's hope. It's not arrogant. Oh. <laughs> or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. You get the picture. If we're looking at doing this in our own strength, we're in trouble. We're in, we're in a lot of trouble. We can't. Okay? Even as Christians, even as people that go to church every time the doors are open, even as people that read our daily devotions every day without fail, even as people that pray over our food most of the time, 
We can't, that's right, or listen to SOS radio. <laughs> that's right. We cannot do this. Why? It's foreign to our nature. It's completely foreign to our nature. So what I, would, I want to encourage you today, look, this is a description of the nature of God. The reason that it's given to us is because God lives in us. Okay? This is kind of a benchmark. It's kind of like a test. You can kind of look and kind of gauge where you're at. Oh, hey, you know what? I'm getting better at this. You know this, this, uh, it is not irritable or resentful. It, it, irritable is a stumbling block for me. I like to highlight that in black. <laughs> <laughs> Things irritate me. That's one of my probably most commonly used phrases around my house. You know what irritates me? <laughs> and Christy pulls out a book, opens up to page 846, <laughs> and gets ready to write a new one. <laughs> no, 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 that's on page 410. <clears throat> I already told you this one. But you know what? The closer I draw to God, the more time I spend in His presence, the more I allow Him to work in me and grow in me and change me and build me, the less irritated I become. The less irritable I am. I don't use those words as often. Agape. It's not about you. Okay? It's Him living in you. The new creation <coughs> is being made. Just, just as a, a potter works with the clay and he's making it and molding it and shaping it, that's our walk. He's making and molding and shaping us. And we look at it and go, Ooh, what's that? I'm not finished yet. I am not finished yet. Abide. Just wait. Be patient. Let him do the work. Let him accomplish what he desires to accomplish. Spend time in his presence. I'll tell you what. We have, um, oh gosh, we've got iPads, we've got iPhones, we've got iPods and pads and TVs and things like that. And, and how many of those do we use to glorify God? Um, between Christy and Mackenzie and I, we have a number of different worship playlists. And typically at any point in the day, you can come into the house and at least one of those is playing. Sometimes all three. <laughs> Sometimes all three. Because Mackenzie will be doing something in the bathroom, getting ready, and she'll have hers going really loud. And Christy will have hers as she's kind of going around. This, this morning, all three of them were playing. Mackenzie's was going in her room. Christy had hers with her. I had mine with me. Now, you can put the music on, and it's just background noise. But if you put the music on and you start worshiping to the music, you start paying attention to what's being said, you start coming before the throne of God, that's when it becomes relevant. That's when SOS becomes a significant thing. Okay? When you've got 40 or 45 minutes between home and Missoula, and you put on SOS radio, and you hear the music playing, and you can worship God to that, that's when it's significant. Okay. If you get to Missoula and went, oh yeah, that was a really catchy tune. Irrelevant. Irrelevant. Okay. So, studying the word, praying, worshiping, fellowshipping, all those are good. All those are necessary. But all those come as a result of having relationship with the Almighty God. Amen. 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 So, as it says in Hebrews, as it says in the Old Testament, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Okay? Don't harden your hearts. Don't turn away. Don't allow yourself to take what God has given you and put it on a shelf to be open and examined at some later date. Open it today. Make use of it today. Grow 
today. Okay? Father, we bless you. Father, we just thank you. Father, for your faithfulness to us. You are so faithful. Father, you're with us in the good times. You're with us in the bad. Father, you've said that you will take us through the fire. You will take us through the flood. Father, when our enemies surround us, you are our shield and our buckler. You are our refuge and our fortress. Father, we shelter in the shadow of your wings. And if you are for us, who can be against us? So, Father, we just ask today that we would grow in our desperation for relationship with you. God, that we would just pour out to you and that we would receive from you. Father, that you would put in our hearts a desire, a longing to be with you. To set aside the busyness of our schedule and just take time to spend in your presence. Father, to worship you because you are so worthy of worship. Father, to honor you, to learn from you, to grow in you. Father, to do that through praying, through studying your word, through fellowshipping with our brothers and sisters, through worshiping. All these things that you have set in place. <clears throat> Strengthen us today, Father, for the long haul. Not for the sprint, for the long haul. We bless you, we honor you, and we thank you for everything that you've done for us, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.